Valeria, can I suggest that you might want to ask somebody to act as chair, just to prevent you having to concentrate on chairing and giving your own presentation? Uh, yeah, do you want to be as a chair? I'm, uh, I mean, I won't, because I just doubt if names all doubt. But, um... Anyone? Uh, Jill, could you be the chair? Sorry, yes, I was doing so. Sorry, you need a chair. Yes, I can I, do I that. I was guessing it would be good to have a chair for Valeria's section. Otherwise, got it, got it. Yes, I can do that. Um, uh, you could just tell me. Uh, I'll also keep track of the time. So one twenty, we're starting. Okay. Thank you very much. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, so it's doing half an hour. Uh, Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, um, how, uh, yeah, observable diffeomorphism, <laughs> or how to extend the uh, direct empirical state assembly with the whole argument. Uh, so, symmetry is usually defined as uh, invariance under transformation. And this suggests, like, uh, in the symmetry, you have just invariance plus transformation. These are two um, components. Actually, there are three uh, because, uh, uh, do you see my mouse actually? Yeah, good. Uh, so there is uh, uh, the invariant part, uh, there is the transformation, but then there is also what it transforms. So, so there is some, some variable, uh, which is uh, which gets a new value and so on. So, so there are three components in a symmetry, uh, more precisely. And uh, if it is a theoretical symmetry, and if you're interested in the ontology, then you would see, uh, 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 something in the world corresponding to your theoretical symmetry. And if you have uh, distinguished uh, the components, then uh, the advantage is that you can seek these counterparts uh, for each comp component separately. And symmetry to reality inference is uh, an instance of this because it's interested in uh, uh, the component which is uh, the invariant part of your symmetry. And it says that this component uh, should have a counterpart in the world. Uh, but uh, this is just the basic claim. What does what what about these other components? If uh, the symmetry to reality is interpreted in a strong sense, and it not only says that invariance, uh, in, the invariant uh, has uh, a worldly counterpart, but it also says that the other elements do not have worldly counterparts. The transformations, uh, transformation, and differences uh, are. Uh, mm, um, exists only in the theory, but not in the world. Uh, and uh, I will call such a theoretical symmetry superfluous. Uh, symmetry so interpreted, I will call it uh, superfluous. Uh, but uh, if you interpret symmetry to reality in a weak sense, then it uh, only says that the invariant part has a counterpart, but it also allows the other components of theoretical symmetry to have uh, counterparts in the world. And I will call a, a theoretical symmetry non-superfluous if it's interpreted as, uh, as, as uh, so that all its components have counterparts and not just the invariant part. So uh, you can think of this. Uh, so the superfluous, uh, it would be uh, Le Leibniz uh, <laughs> interpreting uh, uh, boost on the universe, and uh, non-superfluous is uh, Newton's interpretation of uh, the boost on the universe. Uh, and uh, um, and and uh, uh, we would like to know which symmetries are superfluous and which are non superfluous. So uh, consider usual uh, distinctions into formal kinds of theoretical symmetries. Uh, so here we are in this. Uh, uh, this was about uh, the ontology, so the correspondence between theoretical and uh, worldly. But uh, now, for the moment, we return again to just theoretical. And we classify different symmetries uh, in theory in this uh, usual ways. So external uh, or internal, uh, this means special temporal or non special temporal. And uh, global local means uh, uh, in this, in, in the sense in which it's used in gauge series. So specified by parameters versus functions or uh, but, uh, roughly uh, uniform versus non uniform on the domain of application. And here are examples. So global uh, boosts, uh, translation citations are global and external. So they are special temporal and they apply uniformly on the whole domain in which you apply them. And then uh, phase shifts and electrostatic potential shifts are global internal, um, while uh, electromagnetic potential transformations are local external. And sometimes they are coupled with 
uh, local face transformations. And then the feomorphisms, uh, the example on which I will be concentrating on the dog, uh, these are local and external, so they um, are special temporal and they apply non uniformly on uh, uh, the domain on which you apply them. And we, we are asking which of the symmetries are superfluous and non superfluous, or which are of these kinds of symmetries. Uh, and, and actually, we can. Uh, we can argue that all of them are superfluous. So global external, because uh, uh, Leibniz was saying that boosts of the universe are, mm, mm, do not have a uh, lot of counterparts as to transformations and differences. And then, uh, and we can get, uh, we can make similar arguments for others. Uh, in particular, for local external, so for the film of his, uh, you have the whole argument, which says that uh, mm, the should be interpreted as superfluous because uh, this um, mm, spares you from uh, the indeterminism. And uh, there are even ways to combine the, or generalize this argument, in, in particular, uh, the Dwellers' paper of 2003 uh, implicitly generalizes the whole argument to uh, other external symmetries beyond the film of systems and to other internal symmetries. And uh, this means uh, that uh, the whole argument becomes no longer about space-time ontology because now it applies also to symmetries which are not special temporal, uh, that is internal. Okay, so uh, because uh, you can have an uh, indeterminism also about how internal values evolve uh, through time. And then, but on the other hand, all the same uh, kinds of theoretical symmetry, of formal kinds of theoretical symmetries, can actually be assigned non superfluous interpretations. And as I said already, for example, you have Leibniz and Clark, which disagree on the interpretation of the same symmetries, but you also have. Uh, cases where mm, mm, symmetries are perhaps not the same, but they, at least they are of the same kind. But uh, the important thing is that mm, usually the superfluous interpretation was winning over the non-superfluous. But then there, uh, mm, like 20 years ago, we've got a new way to assign non the non-superfluous interpretation, which is stronger than the previous unconclusive results like the gauge argument and so on. And this is direct empirical status. So uh, you have direct empirical status when your theoretical symmetry is matched with an empirical symmetry in the world. Example, uh, the, the paradigmatic example is Galileo ship. So uh, in the world, uh, you boost a ship and uh, it's, uh, this transformation is observable, uh, the transformation, um, the change in the velocity of the ship with respect to the shore is observable if you make it in the world, but the, the experiments within the ship uh, stay invariant uh, for the observer inside the ship. And so uh, this is an empirical symmetry in the world and it corresponds to a theoretical symmetry uh, of uh, uh, boosting a, a theoretical subsystem. And so, uh, so we can say that the theoretical symmetry is not superfluous because each of its components, including the transformation and the differences, is matched with uh, counterparts in the, uh, the world in this Galileo ship and vehicle series. And it happens that uh, this new strong way of assigning non superfluous interpretation to theoretical symmetries applies to all, all these kinds of symmetries. And uh, in the Gibbs and Wallace article in particular, it was uh, shown to apply to many symmetries except for uh, local external. So it looks like local external symmetries and the diffeomorphism are sounds what exceptional because uh, there was there has not been an explicit demonstration of uh, them being non superfluous or direct empirical status. Uh, while for all the other cases we have such demonstration. Moreover, uh, if you want to explain how does it happen that the same symmetries like boost uh, can be at, at the same time superfluous and non-superfluous, then for all other things besides the geometries, you have a great explanation, namely uh, symmetries are superfluous when they are, they are applying on the whole universe or at least on the whole domain, and they are non-superfluous when they apply on a subsystem or subdomain. This explanation worked well for all the symmetries, but it does not work well for diffeomorphism because all it is the superfluous diffeomorphism 
uh, is also applied on a subdomain. The whole can be accounted for a subdomain or a subsystem if you want. Uh, and uh, the terms is uh, uh, on the whole are already supposed to be superfluous. So the usual explanation uh, of how the same symmetries can be superfluous and non superfluous because they apply to uh, the universe versus uh, its part does not work in the case of deformities either. So, uh, and uh, should we leave it there? Uh, well, no, because it follows actually from uh, Grace and Wallace's uh, work and uh, independently from my work, the deformism should have direct empirical status. If uh, this can be proved uh, explicitly, then uh, we would restore this, uh, so to say, asymmetry between deformisms and uh, all the other symmetries. But of course, we would then have a question, how uh, do we explain also about the film and about the rest that uh, they can be both superfluous and non-superfluous? What is uh, what it does make, what is it that makes them superfluous and non-superfluous even if they have uh, the same formal feature like being uh, global external uh, as a way or global uh, or local external so. so uh, how did, did it happen that the film office do not have the like, empirical status and all the others do? Uh, I guess we will say, uh, we were tempted uh, to include this section about, uh, uh, about, about assigning the film office's uh, uh, direct empirical status. Uh, while we are confident that some such relationship exists, the details are subtle and related to long-standing disputes as to whether general relativity is the gauge theory and the status of general covariance in general relativity, and they lie beyond the scope of this article. So <laughs> they say, we, we are sure the film of this have the chemical status, but it's just too difficult because it relates to so much things which are unsolved and so But uh, uh, no, I, I uh, <laughs> disagree. Okay. Uh, it, we can have an easy way to <laughs> derive the form of his always like the biggest terms. And I will do this uh, in uh, this talk. Uh, and for this, I will reply to the question which synthesis are superfluous and which are not superfluous. Uh, so here's what uh, David Wallace was explaining in his talk, uh, but <laughs> now I will be formulating this in my terms. Okay, so he was. Um, criticizing Dasgupta. So Dasgupta proposed the symmetry to reality inference, uh, and uh, he is studying how to make it valid. And for this, he is uh, using different um, defi definitions of uh, um, symmetry, and, and uh, he uh, prefers those which are, uh, Dasgupta, those which are more ontologically laden because it makes easier to satisfy his symmetry to reality interest. While uh, Wallace says, it is uh, uh, boring and so on, <laughs> it's trivial. You should uh, try to derive ontological things like symmetry to reality interest from formal things. Uh, okay, we have just seen this. And uh, now I will just reformulate this in my terms. So you remember that I was speaking about symmetry to reality inference and I introduced my distinction superfluous, non-superfluous. Uh, so as a just invariant part has counterparts or also the differences and the transformation. Okay, so since I uh, formalized the symmetry to reality inference as a distinction between superfluous and non-superfluous, I will also formalize this other side uh, about definitions of symmetry as also uh, as a distinctions. So I will speak about the correspondence between superfluous and non-superfluous on the other one hand and the ontological distinction or formal distinction on the other. So the trivial questions, question will be uh, how to match an ontological distinction with superfluous and non-superfluous. And the uh, um, non-trivial question will be how to match a formal distinction with superfluous and non-superfluous. Superfluous and non-superfluous itself is an ontological distinction. So uh, to uh, since I'm uh, formalizing this, uh, a debate as a debate about um, distinctions. And uh, <laughs> sorry, I just forgot, I uh, should stop at 15 minutes, yeah? Because uh, I started with uh, you, you have only taken 13 minutes. minutes. So you have 17 yeah. to okay. 22 okay. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, Mm -hmm. So since I'm formalizing this debate as a debate about matching uh, distinctions, 
uh, it is useful to introduce some relationships between which can in principle hold between uh, distinctions. So uh, here you have two distinctions. Uh, so each of them has two sides. So here's superfluous, not superfluous. So distinction, uh, by, uh, I'm taking binary distinction, okay? So suppose this is superfluous, this is not superfluous, and then you have some other distinction like global, local, external, internal, uh, subsystem universal, uh, domain, subdomain, or something else. Uh, and uh, so you consider two such distinctions, and here are some possible relationships. So one is a orthogonality within each uh, each each uh, block, so to say, within each term of one of the distinctions, you have representatives of uh, both terms from the other distinction. So this is a orthogonality. Uh, the opposite is coextensionality. Uh, the distinctions uh, are, they can be matched uh, side by side okay so you have suppose as uh, you have superfluous non-superfluous global local so uh, the the usual idea was um, non-superfluous corresponds to global and superfluous corresponds to local and there is no intersection between them so this would be a coextensionality okay uh, one of the terms from one distinction corresponds to just one of the terms of the other distinction and they don't mix and skew is in between uh, any option, but I, I'm illustrating here a particular option. And uh, if uh, after we have introduced uh, these uh, relationships between distinctions, we um, um, we return to my formalization of this debate. And uh, I'm saying that uh, the right uh, relationship, which is in question here, is coextensionality. Uh, that the what is at stake is uh, to uh, determine which ontological distinction and which formal distinction are coextensional with superfluous and non-superfluous. So I'm saying that we are uh, when we want to know which symmetries are superfluous and which are not, we should find the distinction which is um, coextensional, and then we just look at this, uh, whether um, our symmetry satisfies one of the properties of this other distinction and it helps us to infer whether uh, this symmetry is superfluous or non-superfluous because uh, there is no mixing between having some uh, property of one distinction and uh, being uh, either superfluous or not superfluous okay uh, is, uh, the coexistentiality works such that as soon as you know that, for instance, all global symmetries are uh, non superfluous, okay, you just check whether it's global because it's easier to check than to check whether it's superfluous, and you infer that it's superfluous, so you get your answer. Uh, so this is in principle a useful tool, but now the question is uh, besides the, <laughs> what does this distinction coextension of which superfluous and non superfluous? And, uh, and here are my replies. So, uh, if uh, if we seek an ontological, so first we concentrate on uh, the question: which ontological distinction is coextensional with superfluous, not superfluous? If we really uh, answer this question, then I agree with uh, that it was that uh, it would be trivial because you would be matching two ontological distinctions together. There would be two less difference between them. If you don't know already how to tell whether symmetry is superfluous or not superfluous, it does not help very much to, to if you uh, put it in correspondence with another distinction, which means quite the same, it will not be helpful, okay? But uh, you can replace, um, example is uh, uh, the interior, interior and non-interior from the Greaves and Wallace article. So they uh, define or they presuppose that uh, interior symmetries are all uh, subsystem symmetries, which we, uh, when you combine them with environments on the, with uh, identity on the environment, they yield universal symmetries. And universal symmetries are, are defined in Leibniz and Newtonian terms. So they are defined like or characterized uh, like symmetries which uh, mm, relate representations of the same, uh, uh, which link representations of the same state of affairs and so on. So it's uh, like it's a, a synonym of uh, superfluous. Okay, uh, 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 so much in interior non interior with superfluous non superfluous is trivial. But if uh, you uh, we we can beat your distinction, you require the match not between not of superfluous non superfluous, not with ontological distinction, but with, with just some substantial distinction. Then I'm claiming that it's becoming not trivial already. And my uh, substantial distinction is, is this, uh, what I mentioned, observationally complete uh, versus observationally incomplete. So what's the difference? Ontological is about the world, but observational completeness or incompleteness, it's about the predictions. How ma much pre many predictions are changed 
uh, by your symmetry transformation in your theory. Okay, whatever your theory, whatever change or absence of change that your theory predicts, it does. It, uh, you're not guaranteed that there will be a corresponding change or absence of change in the world. So this is not an ontological notion because it st still stays within the theory. But it's uh, it's a notion about predictions, and if your theory, if your symmetry is empirically adequate, then it entails uh, that it is uh, superfluous or non superfluous. Mm -hmm. If if you as long as this uh, superfluous or non superfluous character is determined by uh, observability. Okay, uh, but uh, and and uh, even this uh, uh, slightly non-trivial uh, um, coextensionality is always a very explanatory successful because it explains, for instance, why uh, Leibniz uh, arguments and the whole argument why do they privilege uh, the interpretation of symmetries concerned by them as superfluous? Because uh, these symmetries are observationally complete, they do not predict any uh, any change. Okay, if there was a prediction of change, you could go into the world and see whether this change obtains, and you would infer whether the symmetry is superfluous or not. But if uh, they do not predict anything, then you by default uh, interpret them as superfluous. Mm. So, so even this has a lot of explanatory value. But uh, the more interesting question uh, was uh, which formal distinction is superfluous, is coextensional superfluous and not superfluous. And uh, here I propose uh, this uh, boundary trivial versus boundary not trivial subsystem symmetries. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, I, I take uh, this analysis distinction which is SQ, okay, so they uh, have a distinction within symmetries which have direct empirical status. And it is between asymptotically trivial and, uh, and especially, no, asymptotically constant and especially constant, okay? And so I, I say that uh, I, I transform it into a coextensional distinction, and the result is uh, boundary trivial versus boundary material subsystem symmetry. And uh, importantly, uh, in, in the David Wallace's presentation, it looked like there is this trivial question and there is a non-trivial question, and we should deal with non-trivial question uh, instead of the trivial. But I don't think, I, I will show that uh, we should not uh, deal with one instead of the other, we should uh, deal with uh, uh, one with the help of the other, and this is more fruitful. So we, we, I will combine the two, okay? I will require the coextensionality not only of my Mm, ontological well, of my substantial distinction with superfluous non superfluous and not only the coextensionality co of my formal distinction with superfluous non superfluous but also the coextensionality of my substantial distinction with my formal distinction. So I will have three coextensional distinctions: superfluous non superfluous observation and complete observation and complete and the boundary trivial boundary not trivial. They are all coextensional. I'm uh, uh, as much as I need. Uh, so now we get to my task, which was I was promising to derive uh, diffeomorphisms uh, which have direct empirical status. Okay, uh, so now we have these uh, three distinctions which I have just introduced. Uh, uh, and uh, direct empirical status is just a particular case of uh, being a non superfluous. So, uh, and we apply this to diffeomorphisms. Uh, and we can do this side uh, by side. So, so we first do this uh, side uh, which concerns the superfluous symmetries. Okay, so there is should, there is supposed to be a, all this notion uh, should supposed to um, are supposed to uh, coincide in the extension. Okay, so the same symmetries are supposed to be superfluous without a direct empirical status observationally complete and boundary trivial. Okay, and we check this. Because uh, the whole diffeomorphisms of the whole argument are superfluous. So they should be observationally complete, they should be bounded to you, which are, and, and subsystem symmetries. We just check this, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, um, we already know that they're observationally complete because otherwise there would be no danger to um, about indeterminism. Indeterminism arise, arises precisely because uh, you have the same, uh, what looks like the same, and uh, you do not know which of the options of tense, okay? This is indeterminism. Uh, and that's why what makes it then superfluous. Uh, but, uh, and uh, they are subsystem symmetries because they apply on the whole. So the main thing to check is actually whether they are boundary trivial. And this is indeed uh, actually said explicitly by Roman and Norton. Uh, they say, uh, so the whole diffeomorphism is something which differs from the identity within the whole, but becomes identity on the boundary of the whole. So this is boundary trivial in the sense that it becomes identity at the boundary. 
Okay, so uh, we can say that one side of my uh, distinctions is, is uh, consistent. Because uh, when applied to diffeomorphism, it uh, characterizes as well uh, the whole diffeomorphism, which has superfluous and so on. But the question is, of course, about the other side. Okay, so now we uh, check the other side. Uh, and it says so bounded in a trivial subsystem diffeomorphism should be observationally incomplete, and they should be non superfluous, uh, more precise, they, sh they should have direct empirical status. And we just check uh, all these uh, things. And we get the film of this with direct empirical status, which are different from the film of this, uh, which are bounded and uh, subject to the whole argument. Okay. So, first stage, uh, we, we should start by bounding and trivial subsystem the film of this. Uh, and uh, we do have boundary non trivial diffeomorphism in Bellot's uh, article uh, about Elvis funds, but uh, they are not subsystem. As he argues that uh, they should be interpreted as symmetries of the universe and not of the subsystem. But uh, we can interpret them back as uh, symmetries of subsystem by using voices that now the cosmological assumption which is just presented. So uh, by uh, we can say that uh, physics is essentially about subsystem and not about the universe. And so uh, we should say, mm, let's interpret Bellot's uh, transformations as being about subsystem and not the universe. Because uh, for instance, suppose we <laughs> believe in the cosmological assumption, at least in this case. Uh, okay, so now we have Bellot's uh, symmetries uh, interpreted as uh, final subsystems, and uh, we now should prove that they are observationally incomplete. If they are observationally incomplete, uh, by definition, this means they entail some predictions of uh, something observably incomplete in the world. So something which, uh, some symmetry which uh, preserves something, but which also induces some change. And so we need uh, an uh, example of what uh, Bellas uh, um, symmetries uh, entail. Uh, uh, okay, uh, we, which uh, empirical change they they predict. And here we have uh, this uh, article by Luz, uh, 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 and she uh, um, takes Bellas' uh, example, interprets it as applying to subsystem symmetries. And she says that it entails the prediction that if you apply your diffeomorphisms to a star, then the star can be observed at, uh, at one, well, 2 a.m. instead of 3 a.m., well, at some time instead of another time. Okay, So the fact of applying uh, diffeomorphism to a star, uh, this uh, boundary material subsystem diffeomorphism of Bellet, uh, it entails the predictions that you observe in the star uh, at a different time. Okay. So, and now we have uh, the third stage to prove that uh, this prediction uh, leads to a uh, directly bigger status of this diffeomorphism. And here we get to the boundary between uh, the theory and the world, because observational completeness is still about predictions. But uh, to prove direct empirical status, you should prove that the, the corresponding uh, empirical symmetry indeed exists in the world, not uh, just uh, is predicted by your theory. And here we have a problem, because uh, if we uh, use this example, we would have to apply uh, worldly diffeomorphism to a star. And we do not know how to act on stars uh, yet. So we cannot practically implement uh, this, uh, the initial conditions for the star example to see whether it indeed uh, yields an empirical symmetry predicted by the diffeomorphism. And this means that we uh, it's not enough to have uh, derived just this one prediction about the star. We need a general uh, range of phenomena implied by this diffeomorphism and not just one star. We need, uh, in particular, such implications which would be practically realizable and which we would check and uh, so as to ensure that they indeed obtain in the world. And uh, to do this, uh, we uh, I can use uh, my uh, proof. So uh, uh, in the thesis and uh, beforehand, I uh, proceeded in this uh, way. I started with uh, an empirical symmetry. You can imagine Galileo's ship of a day's cage. Uh, I uh, took a global symmetry which has direct empirical status by virtue of representing this empirical symmetry. And I built a local symmetry uh, out of this global symmetry. Uh, so for this, I applied to the global symmetry. Uh, which has direct empirical status, some local symmetries which do not have direct empirical status. They don't have the status precisely because they preserve all predictions of the original symmetry. 
This means that the symmetry they yield has the same prediction and has it also has the same empirical status. So the status is preserved, but the symmetry is changed. It becomes from global to local. This is how you generate local symmetries with empirical, with direct empirical status. And now I will do this in reverse. I will start by the geomorphisms uh, with direct empirical status, and I will uh, derive which predictions uh, they entail besides the star example. For this, you uh, go back, you uh, transform your local symmetry into global symmetry. To do this, uh, so you still need to, to um, keep uh, the boundary non-triviality because this, in my approach, is uh, the, the, what entails direct empirical status. So since you cannot uh, change the behavior of the boundary, you can only uh, act on the bulk. So what you do is, uh, so instead of having some, some local symmetry, which is non-uniform in the bulk of your subsystem, you make it uniform, okay? And now it uh, behaves in the bulk, like in the boundary, and so it becomes global. But what is this behavior at the boundary, which is now uh, uh, spread into onto your whole subsystem? Uh, well, uh, the fewer, uh, this is not boundary until the fewer of this, their behavior at the boundary is uh, resembles uh, usual translations. So this means that the global analog of uh, uh, this uh, diffeomorphism with direct empirical status are simply translations. And so, uh, but, and we know which, what is, uh, which phenomena yield the direct empirical status for translations. Uh, these are just uh, displacement of uh, usual objects in the world, which need, now need not be the star. Okay, in the star, you perform a temporal translation by one hour, but uh, you can also translate a usual thing, which is much smaller, and you can also translate especially in the, instead of temporally and so on. So it, it follows that the empirical symmetries corresponding to um, observable diffeomorphisms are, are what uh, uh, usually looks like uh, translations. So here we have, and uh, where is the place of uh, um, whole diffeomorphisms? Well, these are precisely the symmetries which uh, allow you to pass between global and local symmetries with direct empirical status. So they preserve predictions, and, but they themselves uh, do not entail these predictions, so they don't have empirical status. Uh, so, uh, and here I'm finishing, uh, so even the uh, matching of uh, a substantial distinction uh, with uh, uh, superfluous, non-superfluous is already informative, uh, but uh, you can also uh, use it as a stage in your proof of uh, the co-extensionality between a formal distinction and superfluous, non-superfluous, which is a uh, less uh, even less trivial questions. Okay, uh, you, once you have uh, um, demonstrated that the phenomena have direct empirical status, um, um, uh, you now see that uh, local external symmetries are just like local internal and global external and so on. They are all alike. You have completed the last missing piece uh, in this assignment of uh, direct empirical status to different kinds of formal symmetries. And uh, and, and the final is the fact that uh, I put in correspondence uh, the old differences with the translations. This disproves Friedrich association of them with a localized boost instead of uh, translation. And uh, but the only thing which is missing uh, in this whole account is that my formal distinction was actually about just subsystems, but my uh, substantial distinction was about the whole universe. So what is missing on the formal side is the account of the environment. And I, I do it in another. Uh, uh, article and then another talk, and uh, it should be uh, you can find an announcement and uh, afterwards a recording at this uh, website of my venture. But uh, and I thought that we will put uh, recordings of uh, this workshop there, but we will see about this list till uh, later on. Uh, so that's all. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, there's comments. Um, sorry, I'm checking the. No problem, it's from <laughs> <Nobody>. me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. All right, no take it away. Thank you. Great. So, um, first, thanks to Blair for uh, organizing the workshop and the talk and asking me to comment on it. Um, uh, I enjoyed reading the paper, and uh, I just have a couple of sort of disjointed things uh, to say about what I take to be the general and specific contributions of the talk and paper. Um, so the title of the paper she shared with me is Non-Superfluous Symmetries and Coextensional Distinctions. 
Um, and among the distinctive features of her discussion, as we just saw in the talk, is a way of framing exactly what the question is that we're after in terms of distinctions and how they line up. Um, so I take it that the sort of general starting point for the big picture question is something like the intuitive thought that doing some conceptual analysis on the ideas of symmetry and observation will let us say something general about what a physical theory says about the world just based on knowledge about its symmetries, right? So the symmetries of a theory are related to invariances of measurement results. And insofar as a the physical theory privileges measurement results, we have some sort of pro tanto reason to disregard features of a theory that make no difference to measurement results. Of course, whether some feature makes a difference is at least partly something the theory is supposed to tell us. And so it's the theory's job to explain what causes what. But the general idea that I, I, I take it is, is that by appealing to sort of general features of rep mathematical representation and observation, we might be able to say something about physical theories in general. Right, so, so to show the structures, this general thought in terms of how various distinctions line up. And I think that one useful feature of this approach is that it helps you identify which parts of symmetry arguments involve merely premises about representation in general which I take to be the parts that she's calling formal, and then which parts involve some claims about how the world is or how it's likely to be, and she takes calls these substantial. Um, so substantial distinctions concern features of the world and how they're represented, while formal distinctions concern representation as such. The dream is to find a formal distinction and a substantial distinction that are coextensive. That is, to find some formal criteria and that one form is about the furniture of the world according to the theory. Um, so the particular version of the attempt at this dream, which so I was interested in, started maybe with Peter Casso. So Casso argued there's a distinction on the one hand between global symmetries like Lorentz boosts and local symmetries like electromagnetic gauge transformations. And then on the other hand, there's a distinction between symmetries that can be directly observed and those which can only, for which we can only have indirect evidence. Um, and he argued that these co distinctions coincide that the world exhibits a particular symmetry can be directly observed just in case the symmetry is a global one using Galileo's ship as sort of the paradigm example. Um, so, okay, so this brings me to my first question about this way of carving things up. So the virtue of dividing things up this way is that it cleanly separates mathematical issues from physical issues. And, you know, to the extent that mathematics can be less uh, controversial, this is helpful. Um, the danger is that you don't want to separate these things too much because the game is to find the two distinctions that coincide. And um, there's going to be people like, say, the trivial semantic conventionalism types that Jill talked about earlier today. There's going to be people who are going to be skeptical that you can do this, that you can um, talk about how the two distinctions coincide without making it coincide, uh, without making some pretty substantial assumptions or story about how they're supposed to relate it. Right, so the worry is it's hard to see how many facts about mathematics could have any bearing at all on physics unless you've already answered the questions that we're trying to get at here. And so it's hard to see how we're going to get something out of these arguments that we don't directly put in. So maybe this is too broad to be a fair question given the sort of questioning the, the literature, but the first question is just whether you had anything to say, Valeria, about this to this kind of skeptic who thinks that, well, to, these sorts of appeals to formal criteria just can't be separated from the substantial ones. Um, so moving on to the second question, right, there's cases and cases, Casso's paper, I mean, we've sort of renegotiated this distinction many times, and at the risk of oversimplifying, maybe the biggest development of the debate since Casso has been a shift towards formal criteria that concern subsystems, especially in light of or in reaction to um, the Greaves and Walls paper that's been mentioned a few times. And I think, you know, the reason for this shift is clear enough. If we want to observe that some system has undergone a symmetry transformation, we have to be able to observe a difference. And the way to reconcile the invariance of a symmetry transformation with an observable difference is to perform the symmetry transformation on the subsystem and then observe that the world as a whole has changed. Um, and I think, I take it that Chisova's account of direct empirical significance is a version of this. So she argues that we should be concerned with pairs of a state of a system and a state of its environment. There can be discontinuities across the system environment boundary. And Chisova argues that a joint transformation of the system and environment will have a directly observable effect if it changes the existence or degree of this discontinuity. So in the Galileo ship scenario in the paper, she gives as an example, there's a discontinuity if the ship is moving with respect to the shore. And by changing the velocity of the ship, we can create or remove this discontinuity. So one thing we could do is to discuss the essential adequacy of this proposal, whether a transformation is directly empirically significant just in case it changes this discontinuity. I don't know exactly what I think about this because I don't know exactly what I think about this pre-theoretic notion of direct empirical significance. So I have two other sort of sub questions about this. Um, 
Number one, I'm a little worried about the notion of discontinuity being underspecified. So I think it's clear enough that the velocities of the ship and shore are changed in the interesting cases of boosting the ship. But there's also going to be discontinuities if you leave the ship alone and boost the shore. And so it seems like we've lost our original focus on subsystems exactly if we want to have subsystem environment be asymmetric. And now we're sort of just talking about the relation between two systems. And maybe this is okay in general. Maybe, you know, an environment's a subsystem of the sort of system, which is its environment or, or how, maybe these things are symmetric is all I need to say. But in a lot of the controversial cases like Farrell's cage, um, it turns out that in order to apply a symmetry transformation to a subsystem, you also have to adjust the environment. And so it's not clear that it's a symmetry of the subsystem that's accounting for what we're observing rather than just this change we made to the world, right? So this is a Simone Friedrich has, I think, made this, uh, has, has this complaint or worry or whatever. Um, so, so, you know, question two, Part one, is there a principled reason to say that what we're getting in this case is uh, a direct observation of a symmetry? Um, part two, question two, is maybe fuzzy. Uh, and so you don't, you know, maybe there's nothing to say about it. But um, it's not obvious to me how we should determine the symmetries of a subsystem and of the environment. So the sort of recipe from the Gibbs and Wallace paper is to start with the symmetries of the total system, sort of assume that these are known and then consider how these can be restricted to the original system and to its environment. And so, and as David was just saying, this is maybe something you might be satisfied about, or it's an incompleteness in the analysis. Um, right, and so I guess the general question is something like, why should the symmetries of a particular system be determined by the symmetries of the entire universe? Or why should the symmetries of a system coincide with the symmetries of that system qua subsystem of some environment? This seems especially pressing to me if we're gonna move away from the idea, the cosmological assumption. That Larry mentioned, right? If we move away from the idea that what we're doing in interpretation is treating a system of interest as a cosmology and instead take physics to be about subsystems, then there's not going to be sort of a determinate answer about what the symmetries of the system are because we should always think of it as embedded in some larger indeterminate environment or embeddable in some further environment. And so we can't determine the symmetries of the system this way without making the environment determinate. Um, so these are two questions about the sort of formal side of it. Um, Third question, moving on to the main example of diffeomorphism freedom. Uh, I, want, I wanted to ask you, Larry, to say something a bit more about the whole argument. Um, I guess just sort of what you take it to be precisely and how exactly it's being avoided here. So um, I assume you have in mind the version according to which the diffeomorphism variance of the Einstein equation leads to a kind of indeterminism. So the question here is where exactly does the term indeterminism come about? on your view, and how exactly does your interpretation of diffeomorphism symmetry avoid it? So if I understood correctly the, the example, um, the argument is that the diffeomorphism symmetry can have direct empirical consequences when we transform a subsystem and the environment in a way that changes measurable relations between them. This seems like at least considerable difference, but it's not clear to me that this is a case of like uh, observing a symmetry because this isn't a diffeomorphism of the whole thing because we changed the, the observables. And so it, I don't see myself immediately how it's related to the whole argument. Um, and I mean, maybe to spell out why I don't see it as well. I mean, I take it that the reason people feel like there is a tension between the whole argument on the one hand and endowing diffeomorphisms with direct empirical significance on the other um, is sort of in light of some background assumptions, one of which is that we should want to identify diffeomorphism related possibilities on a fixed manifold to avoid indeterminism in the whole argument. Um, and then the second is that like possible subsystems are possible systems that can possibly be related to the environment or something like this. So as I understand the kinds of complaints often voiced by Gordon a lot, the, what, we, what he wants or what, you know, he's, he's complaining to, uh, about some of the more sophisticated substantive those pictures is, um, that he wants a, we, we need a principled story about how the way we count possibilities at the level of universes or space times is related to the way we count possibilities for subsystems. And so in particular, if we want to avoid the whole argument by identifying diffeomorphism related Lorentzian manifolds, then it seems sort of ad hoc to just unidentify them when we're treating them as subsystems. Um, and so this is the third question I wanted to ask. What exactly is it that you want to say about the whole argument such that you've now offered a distinctive sort of way to reconcile it with dis direct empirical uh, significance of, of diffeomorphisms. Um, and then, yeah, how that squares with the treatment of the diffeomorphisms on subsystems. Um, so that's all for me. Thanks again for the paper and, and for the talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I should explain that 
the version which uh, I sent to John, there was an extra section after uh, the section about the pharmacist. So this is what I did not tell in the talk because uh, this now became a second article, is becoming a second article, and it's uh, I will be talking about this next week. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the idea there is that. Mm -hmm. As I said, the, my formal distinction was about subsystem, but my uh, substantial distinction was about the universe. So what is missing on the formal side is the account of the environment. Uh, when I'm saying that boundary trivial uh, versus boundary non-trivial correspond to uh, mm, superfluous versus non-superfluous, uh, I mean uh, that uh, the environment is supposed to be untransformed as in the views in the article or uh, just transformed by an induced transformation, but not by itself. Okay, uh, in uh, the second article or this last section, which I have not talked about, I'm generalizing this to arbitrary states of, of uh, subsystem and environment. And what is important in that case is the discrepancy uh, at the boundary, the discontinuity at the boundary between the subsystem and the environment, whatever the subsystem and environment transformation which yield this discontinuity. So as long as you have this continuity, you have directly bigger status or at least non-superfluous interpretation. And, and if you don't have a discontinuity, you have superfluous interpretation and direct thinking and uh, the absence of direct empirical status. Uh, so um, mm, mm, what I'm saying about the follow argument, uh, so we are here in the context where the environment is unchanged. Uh, so we uh, that's why we can say that uh, our uh, whether the subsistence transformation is boundary trivial or boundary non trivial determines whether we have uh, the whole argument option or the direct empirical option. So, what I'm saying is that in determinism, the whole argument arises within the whole, but uh, the, the observability or inobservability arises at the boundary, since uh, uh, at the, by the time we get to the boundary, uh, <clears throat> the diffeomorphism uh, within the whole it vanishes away, it becomes an identity. <clears throat> at the at this boundary, we don't see any effect. If you go into the, if you are able to go in, inside the hole and uh, uh, keep a track between, uh, uh, well, and you have a discrepancy there because of your diffusion, then you get a uh, um, transformation uh, which has uh, which is non superfluous. Uh, so uh, ultimately. Mm, the superfluous and non-superfluous character is uh, relative to a boundary, and you can, in principle, put uh, it everywhere within the hole, outside the hole. But as long as uh, around your boundary uh, you get identity from both sides, or not, or everything changes the same way, so that there is no mm, discontinuity arising, mm, you still have a superfluous character, and the, the the boundary of the hole is a particular case of that. Um, Substantial, uh, what you said in the beginning, a uh, substantial distinction, it's not an ontological, as well, uh, it was maybe even clearer in the talks and in the article, but substantial is about predictions. Predictions are not about ontology because predictions can fail. Mm, they only became about ontology when they are empirically adequate. So then, then observationally incomplete becomes non superfluous. So substantial is still, uh, so to say, formal, but it's less formal than uh, global, local, uh, boundary preserving, uh, boundary trivial, whatever. Uh, and the block of questions, uh, mm, how, how subsystem, how substantial and formal are related? Well, uh, you, uh, the, the, you can believe that uh, where the ontological, where the observational completeness uh, so substantial distinctions, observationally complete, observationally incomplete. A formal distinction was uh, boundary trivial versus boundary not trivial. As uh, my response was, as I said, you can feel that these two distinctions do not coincide because the second is about subsystems, the first is about the universe. But uh, as long as you generalize it in the way which I have just explained, uh, there, uh, it's plausible that uh, uh, our series are, be, uh, are built in such a way that discrepancies signal uh, on uh, observational changes and the smoothness signals uh, no observational changes. It's uh, how a uh, uh, claim about how our series work. Uh, what about my work in the universe? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it's uh, I'm not, I'm undecided whether um, the cosmological assumption is right. But if it's right, then uh, my account is not endangered by this because just replace the universe by the universe in, <laughs> in uh, square quotes. Okay, so this uh, the universe just means as a greater subsystem. That's all it.
I think you can still get the whole account, it still works. It's it's a force of my account that it allows uh, to transform the environment independently of the subsystem. You can boost the, the shore, you can keep uh, mm, identity on the ship by the usual account. As I said, uh, identity on the ship means uh, it is a subsystem local transformation, so it would have to have no direct impact assess. But as long as you boost the environment, you will still have an observable difference in direct impact assess. My account uh, allows to account for this because it does not make any difference between what is a subsystem and environment. You can switch them independently. This is just the generalization of uh, 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 the idea that every uh, subsystem can become a system, okay, <laughs> and so on. Uh, you switch the labels, but uh, as long as there's a discrepancy between the subsystem and environment, as mentioned, whichever of them is transformed, uh, my account works. It's, it's a force of my account, it's not a weakness. Okay, I uh, yeah, induced transformations. Uh, this distinction is uh, wrong. Uh, so, uh, in Gris and Wallace's article, it's argued that Faraday's cage empirical symmetry is represented by a transformation of the subsystem, which induces a transformation on the environment. While in the Galileo ship case, a transformation of the subsystem does not induce a transformation of the environment. I'm arguing in the second article that this distinction is contextual. If instead of boosting the ship with respect to the shore, you boost the ship with respect to the water, you also get a change on the water just as much as you get a change on the environment as a part. So uh, the difference uh, which Chris and Wallace uh, thought was uh, mm, fundam uh, fundamental within uh, the symmetries of the technical status, the difference between bounded per zone and non-bounded per zone symmetries is actually a contextual difference, which is just about whether, uh, which kind of the environment you transform your subsystem with respect to. Okay, I think we just uh, took a lot of time, but uh, I answered more or less everything. <laughs> Can I ask one follow up real quick? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is just to clarify about the, the relationship between direct empirical significance and superfluousness, uh, superfluity, whatever. Um, I mean, so it seems like one way that something could be superfluous, or super, sorry, the way that superfluous was being used, I understood, was something like it's purely a feature of the mathematics, it doesn't reflect anything about the world at all. Um, and I took it that, like, what is interesting. I mean, what, the reason that Costo introduces direct empirical significance is because he wants to say something like, well, look, maybe you can come up with some sort of argument that, say, that some unobservable feature uh, uh, is, is, has physical effects somehow because, uh, like, like down the chain. So I think Noether's theorems is like the kinds of thing he appeals to that, well, we can, we can explain certain things by positing these unobservable features. Um, and, and then the question of DES is, well, here's one way that it could be, one way to get evidence that something isn't superfluous is that you can just see it. Um, but, you know, the, 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 as I understood, Costa's distinction, non-superfluous is a broader category than DES because something could be not directly observable yet still be non-superfluous. Is that also the way you're using the superfluous, non-superfluous distinction? Uh, well, firstly, I uh, I have a precise definition of superfluous. Uh, well, non-superfluous is where each component of a symmetry, so including transformations and differences, has a counterpart in the world. This corresponds to direct empirical states, but it does not necessarily correspond to indirect empirical status. Okay? So, uh, Costa's notion of uh, empirical status in general is perhaps the same as superfluous, except that he was not going into details. But uh, not experience, uh, so this is uh, indirect empirical status, yeah? So uh, this is indirect because you do, you you broadly associate your theoretical symmetry with something in the world, but you cannot perform the analysis component wise. While in direct empirical status you can because your your boost of subsystem in the theory correspond to the boost of the ship. Your differences between um, initial and the final velocity correspond to the differences of your real ship in the world. Okay, your uh, invariant part with predictions about what happens within the ship corresponds to what really happens with 
analysis in the ship and really stays in variance. So you perform the analysis uh, component-wise, and each component have, have of the theoretical symmetry has a counterpart in the world. This is the identical status. And uh, more precisely, this counterpart uh, whole uh, should amount to, should, should be Galileo ship-like, uh, if you want to call it direct empirical status. Yeah, but in general, direct empirical status is a, a sub, or like a, a sub, uh, and there is an option within how to be non-superfluous if you understand non-superfluous merely in the sense of having a counterpart in the world without the component-wise analysis. Valeria, do you want to um, wrap things up and stick to the original schedule, or should I give people a few minutes to ask questions? Uh, yeah, let's finish in uh, one or uh, two minutes. Uh, so if there is one or two short questions, uh, okay. make Any a short one. Uh, if, if you have questions <laughs> at Any all. Uh, yeah, David? So I'm just trying to get a bit clearer on the route by which we're supposed to be getting direct empirical significance from um, boundary non-trivial diffeomorphisms. So there are two relatively clear cases. If there's diffeomorphism vanishes at the boundary, that's fine. It's just a gauge transformation. It's just redescriptive. It's just a whole argument case. Fine. If I'm in some sector of the theory with some relatively friendly boundary conditions, so let's say the sector I'm in has asymptotically Minkowski and boundary conditions, <laughs> and now I have um, a diffeomorphism that asymptotically doesn't vanish but preserves those boundary conditions, now again we have a relatively clear understanding of how we can think of that as a, um, as, as a physical transformation with direct variable significance. In, in, indeed, that's exactly how we're going to want to think about the, um, the asymptote, you know, the, the, the Poincare transformations of subsystems in, of, of isolated subsystems in young relativity and analogously how we're going to want to think about asymptotic phase transformations in, in gauge theory. Um, <clears throat> I'm struggling to, uh, to know how I should think about what, what's even going on in trying to say there could be empirical significance of some gauge trans, some diffeomorphism that you know is, is some hideous mess of the boundaries doesn't faintly preserve the boundaries doesn't preserve preserve the sector certainly can't be understood as a rearrangement of the system against other things now of course you could change the boundary but and you know this is the problem here you know bound stuff against the bit and didn't really have a completely satisfactory thing to say to it of course you can change the environment but if you're not careful, you just end up reversing the transformation. So I'm trying to get a handle on what's, I mean, I mean, what, what, what concretely we're saying when we say an arbitrary boundary, non-trivial transformation has direct empirical significance. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, I guess you mean uh, by changes about the, uh, I guess you mean uh, changes the environment like in the Gleason Wallace article. Mm, so, uh, I, I don't know what, what it uh, implies in general, but in the case of diffeomorphists, uh, non boundary non trivial diffeomorphists uh, are supposed to behave at the boundary just like translations. So if you don't have problem with uh, uh, having translations for direct empirical status and you shouldn't have for diffeomorphisms because they are indistinguishable. As I said uh, in Bell's example, uh, uh, Bell's transformations and the uh, Lutz example, uh, they mm, diffeomorphisms behave at the boundary like translations, uh, like time translations. Okay, so they don't change uh, the environment. They change uh, just uh, uh, where you see the subs uh, where, when you see the subsystem. Okay, so maybe this is my misunderstanding, but um, I thought boundary trivial versus boundary non-trivial was supposed to be exhaustive. Uh, uh, there are plenty of transformations which are neither interpretable as asymptotic translations nor asymptotically vanishing. I mean, there are some actually innocuous ones like rotations or boosts, but there are also some hideous ones that don't preserve the boundary conditions. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, they, 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 I think uh, I forgot to mention maybe uh, uh, the problem is... Uh, Boundary trivial and boundary non-trivial, in my case, refer to the subsystem side of the boundary. It does not say that the environment changes. In your uh, this is article, uh, uh, boundary preserving versus boundary uh, changing, this uh, it says versus the environment changes. Okay, I'm saying versus the subsystem changes. 
I'm speaking about zero set of the boundary. So yeah, my... yeah, no, but it's, it's still the case that not all boundary non-trivial things will be translations. There are lots of uh, different options to which I'm interested in assigned direct and vehicle status behave at the boundary like translations. Oh, so it isn't true that boundary trivial, boundary non-trivial is meant to be exhaustive. There are plenty of transformations which are not which are neither. Uh, it's meant to be exhaustive, but uh, so, so again, but, 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 but there are lots of transformations which clearly are not are not interpretable straightforwardly as translations. Um, again, just just let the diffeomorphism be non-zero everywhere everywhere at the boundary, but do different things in different places, so it doesn't preserve the boundary conditions. <laughs> You know, the, the boundary condition preserving transformations are absolutely interpretable as, well, not just translations, but Poincare transformations generally. But that isn't an option if my boundary, if, if my asymptotically non vanishing gauge transformation shatters the boundary conditions. You seem to presuppose that if uh, the change at the boundary is different in different places, uh, then it will also change the environment. No, just what it just won't change the map, it'll just won't preserve the boundary conditions. Yeah, but by boundary condition, you mean the environment. This is a formal mathematical statement. Uh, yeah, I understand it as in the Gibbs and Wallace article. So there is subsystem, there is environment, okay? Uh, Diffeomorphism uh, is non trivial in the bulk, but it can be trivial or non trivial in the boundary. If it is non trivial, it can be moreover constant or non constant. Okay, if it uh, behaves like translation, this means it's constant on the boundary. It's non trivial, but it's constant. It's, it, it adds the same uh, our, uh, value everywhere. Okay, translation uh, in your account of this and all this, uh, it is boundary preserving on the environment. So if it adds, uh, if you add uh, one hour uh, everywhere around your star, uh, because you are transla time translating it, then the environment. Uh, is still can it still be identity okay uh, so for for my uh, purpose of the form of uh, constancy at the boundary non-trivial constancy at the boundary is enough uh, why do i generalize to non-triviality because of uh, this uh, 2016 article where he is dealing not with the form of his but with internal symmetries and here he is saying that um, they should be um, uh, they can be also uh, non-constant as the boundary and yeah, and, and you'll directly be the status as long as they are non-trivial. Yeah, I better not follow up because I know we've got time to well, we Yeah, we just hit the one hour mark for your session, Valeria. So uh, perhaps we should end so we don't get too late on the next one. Uh, yeah, does that yeah. make sense? We, uh, you mean that we finish? Uh, uh, yes, it's been one hour since you started. Yeah. So let's finish. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>